thank you all for coming. Thank you for staying. Uh, exciting again to see a full house. Um, it's my privilege and honor to introduce tonight's speakers. Um, Tiana Nikia McLaughlin, whose film you saw, The Labyrinth 1.0, is a Philadelphia-based curator, visual artist, and filmmaker whose work explores and critiques issues at the intersections of race, gender, sexuality, and social commentary. Themes examined in McLaughlin's films and works have been rememory and more recently, narrative biomythography and shared ideas, values, and beliefs within the African diaspora, which she calls Black Mentifact. McLaughlin's work is interested in exploring intersubjectivities within black communities as a tool for creating insider perspectives within film, time-based work, and objects. McLaughlin lives and works in Philadelphia. Ray Lu uh, let's give it up for Tiana. <laughs> Ray Lewis Thornton is a Chicago-based Emmy Award-winning AIDS activist. She's been featured in countless magazines and media outlets, including Women's Day, Essence, Ebony, Jet, Glamour, O, The Oprah Magazine, and shows such as The Oprah Winfrey Show, Nightline, Dateline, Huffington Post, CNN, and BET, and many more. She's an award-winning blogger, jewelry designer, and artist. Ray has been living with HIV for 34 years. Let's give it up for Ray. And Charles Long is a Chicago-based multidisciplinary artist, activist, and black liberationist. He's worked in communities across the United States with poor, disabled, young LGBT, currently and formerly active drug users, and formerly homeless folks. Charles has worked in all realms of the social justice arena, doing everything from direct service provision, lobbying, development, communications, and direct action. He uses that background to inform both his artistic and movement work with a particular lens of black, queer, feminist perspectives that naturally create space for growth rooted in true freedom. Let's give it up for Charles. <laughs> so we hope the conversation tonight is gonna engage and extend the issues raised in the films. That's Ooh. Sorry. Yeah. Retrograde. Um, <laughs> as further context for Day Without Art's prioritizing of black <laughs> narratives within the ongoing HIV AIDS crisis. So, Tiana, let's start with you. Um, we've had an ongoing dialogue this year about what you refer to as fractured archives, mm -hmm. and I'm hoping you can zoom out from the Labyrinth 1.0 and situate this film in relationship to your larger Brad Johnson project. Um, as well as the trilogy of creatives whose life and legacies you've recently been animating through your own work. Okay, okay. Um, so uh, the Labyrinth uh, 1.0 is um, a smaller segment of a larger body of work around uh, the poet um, Brad Johnson. Um, I've been, for since about like 2014, pondering it, but really started to make moves in 2015 with this like form of a trilogy of sorts that's just looking at um, three uh, black gay men who produced uh, work at the height of the H HIV and AIDS epidemic, prim primarily within that late 80s, early 90s um, uh, time frame. And so the first project that I did was a commission uh, from the Institute of Contemporary Art in Philadelphia, um, which is called uh, uh, Affixing Ceremonies for Movements for Essex. It's, it's uh, a project that's on the poet um, Essex Hemphill. And so with that project, it's a, it, was a on, it is an online-based uh, project. It's actually going to launch on my website in a week or so, um, where I basically traveled uh, to DC and a couple of neighboring states from, from Philly, as well as talking to people within Philly, to go and see um, all the things that they had, or people who survived Essex had, what things they had of his. Because Essex Hemphill doesn't have a formal archive. The archive that he has or the files that he's included in, primarily with um, his um, former uh, partner, um, creative partner, Wayson Jones, is a file that's related to their performances. And so um, my interest in the archive took me to just seek out the survivors, lovers, uh, family, and friends to see what they had and do these audio pieces um, that allude to what would create a, um, a fractured body or a portrait of sorts of Essex. Then um, around the same time, I started to do work on um, this uh, uh, composer, Julius Eastman, um, a black gay composer, experimental um, composer and uh, pianist. Um, and that form of work took me to a curatorial practice where I ended up curating his um, retrospective project. 
that uh, premiered um, this year in uh, Philadelphia in May, and it's gonna be opening um, January 19th at The Kitchen. It's gonna be really, really cool. Um, two parts, um, I create, curated two exhibits, and then my co-curator took care of the music because I have no music skills whatsoever. Um, and then uh, last year, early, early last year, um, I came across um, this book, uh, Other Countries, um, which a lot of folks probably know of. Um, but I had never really held a copy. I found it in Philly at a bookstore that's kind of up the street from the Institute of Contemporary Art. And I was really interested in that, that publication based on its um, interview with Bayard Rustin, actually, uh, where he like just telling everything, like, I'm gay, you know, like I was with this, 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 you know, and then Martin Luther King, you know? Um, <laughs> and so in reading that, I found, I came across um, this uh, piece by Brad Johnson called Unsubjugation. And it like blew me away. Um, I became completely obsessed with it. And uh, that led me to develop a different kind of body of work that for the sake of time I really won't go into. But a piece of that is on view now um, in a group show speech acts at the Institute of Contemporary Art Philadelphia. Um, where it finds me um, suspended by my feet uh, reading the poem um, uh, with all the elements that it took to do the piece for my studio and the exhibition. And so getting to the labyrinth, the labyrinth, you know, and I think this still is really cool because it's like, kind of gives me a chance to unpack what you're seeing, you know. Um, this is kind of a glimpse at uh, a, a, a formal um, project that includes sculptures uh, and um, multi-channel video works um, that I'm working on. So this is kind of like just a trailer of sorts. Um, the, the version I have is a little bit more X-rated uh, than this. Um, and the pieces, the stalls that you see are actually me putting them together to have a kind of like visual iconography, but the way that they're gonna be exhibited are separate as separate objects all throughout you know, a certain kind of space and covered in leather and things of that nature. But Brad Johnson, um, the reason that I've kind of produced this kind of level of work for him is because not a lot of people knew him at all. Um, and so I figured that I would, uh, or pledged to myself that I would take two years of my practice to dedicate to um, creating work on, be on behalf of him and working with um, you know, people who knew him to uh, uplift his name and put him in a conversation that he uh, kind of existed during that time, but because of all of his peers dying at the same time, he kind of got swallowed up into that. And just as a quick follow-up, how are you situating yourself in relationship to these artists? Where, where does your interest in engaging their mm -hmm. archives, and how does it, HIV AIDS and legacy play into that relationship? Yeah, um, so I'm born in 81. Um, and although, although that isn't the exact year where um, you know, HIV AIDS was discovered, it's usually touted as a year where it hit this, this, this height. And so every year, first documented yeah, for CD. first documented cases for CDC. Okay, 81, because um, my friend, there's an interview I have with my friend T Ted Kerr, who has an, another um, uh, expose of a case that t happened in, I think, the late 60s, 70s. Probably. Um, yeah, 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 a really lovely project on him. Um, and so with that, I've always had to deal with a birthday that coincides with this like, you know, kind of anniversary uh, acknowledgement of um, the disease. And so when I got the resources in 2012, I started to embark on making work um, or taking a project once a year that would like kind of acknowledge that. Um, and so my interest has to do with the fact that I feel as I was progressively doing work, I was amongst peers who like to tout themselves as the first to do things. And because I'm such a big um, archive buff or history buff, I was just like, you're not the first to do things. <laughs> uh, and it just got kind of you know, tiring with like, <laughs> explaining that, but then realizing that these people actually really don't know because they don't have access. No one except me with my weird ass goes casually to an archive and sits for a day and reads these things. So I started to um, really figure out and think about what I could do to um, creatively, uh, you know, reference these voices in a way that allowed them to be uplifted and have a stronghold as the foundational concept of the work, while also pushing forward a kind of creative exploration myself. And so that's where I, push, you know, kind of see myself. And I mean, in the publication, when I, in my statement, um, I talk about what it means to be a, a part of a legacy of, you know, black, lesbian, black, queer women who cared for these individuals. Um, and I see that as like an extension of that in a different kind of way, artistically. Um, so it helps me to satisfy my own interests 
but also like what it means to creatively put these in these different spaces, even being a part of the screening, it's like it helps to have this conversation to decentralize um, some of the uh, more intellectual spaces that this has a stronghold on, a lot of the conferences and things that people just are simply not going to. Um, you do need creative angles to kind of reach people to have these kind of conversations. And I'm primarily, even though I focused on these men, my first project literally deals with black lesbian women getting tested. Um, and so I'll close with this. It's like my first film, uh, my film, my short film, um, Bum and Cigarettes, that I made in 2012, uh, dealt with a conversation between a black lesbian woman and an um, uh, HIV positive man who had HIV for 20, 20 plus years. Um, during, it's like a time, piece that's timed to the rapid um, test that takes 10 minutes to get your results. Um, because I knew personally growing up of women who um, acquired HIV uh, through having sex with other women. Even though it wasn't until, um, I think it was 20, 2014, the CDC, CDC came about with the, the, the document that said in 2012, here is actual case in Houston where it was a likely transmission, because when I put that film out, people were telling me, they, some people wouldn't screen it because they said it's not possible, right? Yeah, yeah, and so, um, you know, this interest crosses gender for me, um, geography, and um, it's really trying to push the idea that people need to be aware of it in all communities. Cool. Thanks, Dion. Ray. Um, your 1994 Essence cover story was a landmark moment in terms of visibility, that's on our right here, mm -hmm. um, and discussion within the black community around intersectional issues and HIV AIDS, particularly its impact on black women. Um, can you describe what the hypervisibility hyper of that moment felt like then, and then when you think back about that time, what does it feel like to you now? Wow, the cover of Essence. Um, first, let me tell you how I got there. I had been infected for 10 years, about eight, nine, eight, ten 10 years. I had known since 87 my status. I was infected in 83. And so I transitioned to AIDS. Uh, that first seven years, I kept it a secret. I told five people that I was infected, other than the men I dated. And because uh, I was working in politics, and I didn't want people it to interfere with my work. Um, I wasn't just working in politics, I was a national organizer working on presidential and congressional races. People like Donna Brazil were my counterparts, my peers, and so I kept it a secret. And then when I transitioned to AIDS in 91, 92 really was the turning point for me in my health. The life expectancy for someone was three years, bottom line, AIDS life expectancy was three years. And I was pretty much on that timeline. I went from a size 12 to a size four in six months. I started to have menstrual cycles that were lasting 10, 15, 22 days. Um, I went from three pills a day to 23 pills a day. Um, and it really, I, I started to have opportunistic infections. I was wasting yeast, um, anyway. So I told. I went public, I started to tell my friends and what little family I had back then. I have none now. And, um, and so, everybody knew, I became everybody's gossip. Um, everybody wanted to know who I had sex with, when, where, why. And then um, a guy called me from T-PAN, Test Positive Aware, and, uh, uh, one of the volunteer coordinators there, and he said, will you go speak at a high school? And I was like, you, he knew I was an activist. I wasn't an ACE activist, you know, I was an activist. Was like, this teacher called, and she wants someone who's not gay and who's drug free. Will you do it? And I was like, hell no. I ain't trying to do that. <laughs> uh, he convinced me to talk to the teacher. Uh, I called the teacher. And she convinced me to come to her school. I never really was a speaker. I was the person you could drop in the middle of a cornfield and tell me you want 10,000 people there at the end of the week and I could have them. And um, so I went to this school, uh, four workshops a day. I spoke, the bell rang. I spoke again, the bell rang. And I noticed that there were kids still standing around. And I went to the teacher and I said, can you tell me why these kids are skipping, like why are they still here? She said, because they're skipping class to hear you speak again. I was like, oh. So the next day I went and they were like in the aisles and the, those who had heard about me, the kids were talking about me all over the school. 
And at the end of the day, a little Hispanic girl said, um, Ms. Lewis, I know you said you weren't a public speaker, but you shouldn't stop because God is using you. And I pat that baby on her back, and I said, thank you, baby. And under my breath, I said, what the hell she know about the Lord using somebody? <laughs> <laughs> and I couldn't shake it. And so two weeks later, I quit my well-parent job. I was actually the field director for someone who was running for mayor here in Chicago. I quit my job with no speaking engagement set up, no brochure, no direction on how to go about another gig. And then school started to come. And I got a community service award uh, at the first Black Expo for Today's Woman. It was their first award, first event, and it was a really big deal. And Black America was there in large numbers, and they were looking some kind of good. It was a formal affair, uh, and I was looking fabulous. I had on a gray sequence Lily Rubin dress and some gray satin Stuart at Wiseman pumps. And men had been hitting on me all night. Men sitting next to women had been hitting on me all night. I had so many numbers in my purse. So when I stood up to receive my award, I, um, I said, you know, y'all, black folks, y'all in denial. I said, not only do I have, I said, men have been hitting on me all night. I said, not only do I have a HIV, but I have AIDS. And you could hear a pin drop, literally. And then I said, thank you for the award. <laughs> 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 and as I was walking off the stage, uh, the stage, the keynote speaker that evening was Susan Taylor, the editor-in-chief of Essence Magazine. She grabbed my hand and said, can I do a story on you? And I said, yes. Two weeks later, Ms. Taylor called me and said, uh, and many, a lot of her senior staff was there that night. A lot of her senior editors was there with her that night. And so they had, I'd been sitting at the table with her husband, Mickey Taylor, the beauty editor there. And she said, my staff and I have discussed it, and we would like to put you on the cover of our magazine. And I said, Miss Taylor, there's not a black woman in America who wouldn't want to be on the cover of your magazine, but you know nothing about me. You heard me speak for exactly three minutes. Why would you put me on the cover? She said, um, I believe you have a story to tell, and I want to tell it. Uh, it is one of Essence's most iconic covers. Uh, when people honor Susan, this is, they call me for permission to use this cover. It was a very revolutionary thing in 1994. Um, Essence has always been reserved for celebrities, African American celebrities, and supermodels. And I was not neither, either of those. And I became talk from one end of the country to the other end of the country. It became a conversation. Um, I cut my hair really, really short after uh, the photo shoot, because you know magazines are like six months ahead of themselves. And I was standing in the grocery store, and there were two African-American women in front of me. Uh, and they were debating. Uh, it was the Hyde Park Co-op. I'll never forget it. They were debating. Um, <laughs> about the cover, and um, they were saying, nah, she ain't got AIDS. The, one, the woman on the inside got AIDS. And I said, no. Nah. And so finally, I just tapped them on the cover sh shoulder, and I said, yeah, she has AIDS. And they said, H how is that, you know, how do you know? I said, because that's me. <laughs> and, um, and women bring this article to me in mint condition. Mm -hmm. And uh, today, and everyone has a story about how this cover saved their life and changed the way they saw HIV AIDS. Um, let me say this about the cover. The owner of Essence at the time said to me that we didn't want to do it. I mean, there was a literally a debate in-house on whether they should put a no-name woman on the cover of their magazine. And Susan won the debate. Um, I'm thinking about this because I posted a picture on my Instagram uh, around World AIDS Day a couple days ago. Uh, a, p a picture we took, I wish I had it for you, a, a picture we took at the very end of, after 12 hours of shooting. The photographer said, stand on this, it was a podium. And I was like this, and I was on the ball of my foot, and the dress was a lace cutout. 
And they wanted that to be on the inside of the map. It was a, a phenomenal picture. But the problem was it was see-through. And you could kind of see the silhouette of my breasts. And they thought it was too provocative. Uh, for sure, we, we made history. Um, and I'm honored to be that person at that time in history that did that thing. And I'm always remembered for that. But for me, it was an extension of my ministry. It was an extension of how God could use me to do a thing. And, and so that's what I'm most happy with. A caveat, the AIDS community gave me a lot of flack. First of all, here, who, who's this black girl that didn't know who the fuck I was? Mm -hmm. I mean, really, coming into this pandemic 14 years late and on a cover of a magazine, and then I said I was dying. Well, I never saw that. They sent me <laughs> the picture, and so I didn't see facing AIDS, young, educated, drug-free, dying of AIDS until I received my copy, my advanced copy. Matt, if you know, there's no other advertising on here. That's very, very rare to not tell you what else is in this magazine. This is the literal cover. They removed everything from it but me. And AIDS activists said, why would you tell us you're dying? And I would say, shit, my T-cell count is eight. I am dying. Yeah. And unless you can tell me something other than that, you know, because uh, I was. I was on that timeline to death. Now, I was actually at Essence when I did this. Um, this was the 20th anniversary, and I was in New York, and I, it still has the weight that it had 23 years ago. I mean, it literally still has that weight. And it will forever be one of the things that I, as an African-American woman, that I'm proud of. You know, who would have thought? And of course, once you're on the cover of a magazine, everybody else calls. And then it was like, um, you know, it just flowed and everyone else called. And I continue to do, the, to do this work. And so I was this person just kind of thrown into a national arena. And I want to piggyback off of something I heard in the first documentary where there was this discussion about the woman with HIV, basically uneducated, un not able to really articulate her story. I will say that one of the things, Susan didn't know this when she put me on the cover, but one of the things that made me good and made me good media was that I was educated, and I was articulate, and I could talk about HIV, and I could talk about my life in a way that it reached others. So Nightline came calling and spent six months with me on the road and did a Ray story. And so it, it was an era where who I am, educated, my color, my skin color, was impactful. I mean, it's just the reality of where we were in 1984 with this disease. And my life kind of sum totaled it. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So Charles, from afar in New York City, I'm consistently provoked, moved, and excited by the work and messaging you're producing, um, a range of which we see here. Can you talk us through some of these images and actions to give us a better sense of your practice and the ways that you're reimagining or calling into questions tropes around HIV AIDS prevention, broader histories, and activism now? Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, so in the top right is um, a demonstration I was at, able to do um, on the year murderversary of Mike Brown. Um, that's in front of the uh, U.S. Courthouse in St. Louis, right underneath the arch, where the Dred Scott decision happened, where Dred Scott was basically the United States saying that black people weren't legally people. Um, Dred Scott sued the state of, he sued his master for his freedom as a man. They told him he wasn't a man, and that was a U.S. Supreme Court case. 
In the middle is a booklet I made around Nancy Reagan is called Nancy Reagan is Killing Me, which focused on some comments that Hillary Clinton made during the election cycle where she said, if it had not been for the Reagans, we had done nothing about AIDS. <laughs> and so I got really pissed, so I made a book about it. Um, I don't care. It's just flagrant. Um, it's just like, why are you lying? Um, and right over here is, um, is in uh, Stone Mountain in Georgia. Stone Mountain is where Martin Luther King refers to from the mountains of Georgia. Um, but still today on their mountain, there's a carving in the mountain of Confederate soldiers. Um, and Coca-Cola is a big sponsor. So I helped a bunch of like righteous white folks um, raise a banner uh, covering it up one day. Uh, it's a big tourist attraction. If you live outside of Atlanta, it's like one of those things you do on like Sunday and drive. People jog around the park, all this huge mountain dedicated to racism. Um, on the below uh, is a series of works I did. One, the middle one was commissioned by Visual Aids, and the other two are just uh, me playing with uh, kind of, I did, I was uh, a, a case manager for HIV Positive Youth here in Chicago at Howard Brown for many years. Um, and taught many people to like have that first conversation about negotiating safer sex. But what I found happens is now still happening. We're using this coded language like clean and DDF. And when I was telling people to like have real conversations about testing and when was the last time, less about judging folks about what you were doing and more about having honest conversations. And so this was just to bring up and call more attention to the fact that we've slipped back into this language that's coded and actually isn't clarifying anything for us and isn't making anybody safer. Um, one thing I, I think that is like really sticking with me right now and that I want to lift up is that I think through the years and what we're seeing in like all the numbers and that black people make up the larger amount of infections at each year is that we keep allowing whiteness to invisibilize itself. Um, and I think that erasure happens and we allow that and then some, there's something around that that we need to contend with uh, as people who care, as people of color, as the other. Um, and what's so powerful and what I really am thankful for visual aids in terms of putting their money where their mouth is, is actually mobilizing the multitude of our stories, right? Um, whereas Ray was a well-educated uh, non-drug using black woman, um, I, I still think there's room for her as well as the, the Brontes Purne Purnells of the world, right? And we aren't seeing the full complexity of our blackness and we're allowing whiteness to remain as the norm. And so I, I, I hope that in my work and in all of these works, I think are really pushing for that to be just deconstructed in a way that I, I'm, I'm very excited about. And I just want to say one quick thing about the numbers. Uh, yes, we are 44% of the HIV cases, but actually, when you really start to look at the numbers, um, CDC has said that the number of cases of women has actually gone down. And so, if black women were the largest, it's gone down across the board in female, which means that a good portion of the newly infected people are, are black men. Uh, specifically young black men. And so um, when we just lump the black community into this one statistic, uh, we don't give voice to young black gay men who are, uh, who we are not helping. You know, they are dealing with rejection within the community and within our own community. Um, they don't have an environment for, to be safe and to be who they are. And, and so numbers can be tricky, you know, and numbers can exclude um, just by virtue of lumping us all in, which means then we don't have to address the problem, which means white gay men don't have to address the issue of young black gay men and stuff. So, it, you know, it goes on because the largest rising group really are young people. Yeah, and I think there's also like a thing that's happening where we're getting numbers from the CDC, which is this institution who has been in the fight since the beginning, technically, right? And like, so what have you been doing for young black gay men, right? As far as I can remember, every four years or so, you're pitting a, them against heterosexual black women in terms of where the dollars were coming, the CDC oh, okay. or the powers that be. No, not you, not, no, 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 no. I was just gonna no, fight. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> Put some Vaseline uh, on my face. <laughs> 
No, but I mean, we, we the institutions. This is so. What, so, so what's also powerful about this is that you know we live intersected lives, mm -hmm. right? In which we are both women and men, and gay and straight and drug user, homeless, and all those things counteract and make up our full breadth of who we are. But the prevention efforts that have been put forth don't address that, which making your work. Uh, Tiana, so important around uncovering what are the histories of these black gay men that are lost? There, there's a generation that's gone, and if we don't even know what happened to them, where are and are those and those who do know are too in pain to speak to it? Yeah, absolutely. Right? Because we're st we haven't dealt with that trauma absolutely. of loss, right? Because yeah. like World AIDS Day for me personally this year was like horrific. horrific. I was like, stop reminding me of like mm -hmm. all of these people I've lost. Like I'm super excited to be here and talking to y'all about this, but. It is hard, right? Mm -hmm. you, I carry them every day with me and in my body and in all the ways that I move. Mm -hmm. But I also know their histories, right? And so I'm very connected and I bring them in all the time. But we have this one day a year where we get this flashpoint and we get to hear that 45, we get to hear these statistics about what's wrong and what all these things, but then there's there's no, com it lacks complexity mm -hmm. and, and, um, and depth. And I just know that that's not true. So I'm just glad that we're here to see these, these deepened stories. And I'll just say too that the, there's a curatorial statement from Aaron Cristoval and Vivian Crockett on Visual Aid's website and in the publication that we produce, and that's to speak to your point around plurality. They talk a lot about that, that the idea of, of centering black voices in the project is to allow for there to be expansiveness in diaspora and queerness in terms of all the intersecting voices that come through in the range of programs. So that's really what they were thinking about intergenerational perspectives, mm -hmm. a range of um, people in terms of the commissions of the new films. So. Um, I think let's turn to the films a little bit. I'm going to ask Tiana a process question. Um, what, what are we seeing in your film? I know there's found footage, there's newly created footage in your studio, mm -hmm. you're collaborating with folks. Um, what, are we, what was sort of the range of material in the video? Okay. Um, so I, I, I primarily, I do like to stay away from found language because it's like, oh. it's like I, did, I don't feel like I found it. Um, it's like been there for a while, the footage that I'm, I'm sourcing. Uh, it's footage that's been removed and uh, posted, removed and posted across a lot of like porn sites. Um, so I have a weird thing. I, so I don't, so I don't like porn, <laughs> but I like tea room porn, which is bathroom sex porn, right? Primarily because I'm interested and I find it very. I find the gestures that uh, that allude to sex very sexy. Um, I'm not really so much tied to nudity in, I think, a lot of the ways that people um, are or would think I would be. But um, so I'm interested in that level of like restraint that you see when you're seeing people who are having sex, who uh, are assuming someone's going to catch them having sex. Um, so with thinking about this, I had to go back to you know the archival work or the archival study that I did on Brad. So Brad was. Um, in the military, um, before that, he graduated uh, from um, in, in, from high school in Philadelphia, fluent in French. Went to Yale, straight out of Yale, went into the Navy. Pre asked, don't uh, pre asked, uh, don't ask, don't tell. Was out in the Navy, served in eighty one to eighty five on an active, um, very 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 popular um, warship, the USS uh, Nassau. Fresh out of that, came to uh, Philadelphia, met Joseph Beam. Joseph Beam published him in. Um, uh, in the life, and then from there he had a, a minimal um, level of uh, publications uh, where his work was found. Within his um, time, and within a lot of the archival work that I looked at, he has provided for me a, a lot of language around the interiorities of SM and BDSM um, based on his own ex experiences and based on my experiences. So um, for me, I consider him someone that's given language to very, very complicated uh, uh, Copy, just something that's, uh, that I can't even articulate as well as I felt that he, he's able to. Um, and so with thinking about The Labyrinth, um, uh, which is his original poem, the poem is called The Labyrinth, and mine is Labyrinth 1.0. And looking at that piece, it's really about cruising, and it actually could be read as something that deals with cruising in an outside space, actually, like thinking about parks. What I do know personally from looking at the archive is that he has engaged in a lot of different experience experiments and experiences related to SM and was really interested in cruising. He cruised and um, was both John and also, uh, you know, Seeker. And so, <coughs> uh, or uh, the other end. And um, 
So I was interested in looking at two uh, tea room porns, one that was shot uh, as an actual porn where the men are aware of, of what's going on and are like fully dressed, these beautiful black men in this um, like 1970s uh, uh, porn. It's actually in color because I process everything to black and white. Um, taken off of like X-Tube. Um, the other is a 1962 uh, police surveillance um, uh, uh, film shot in 16 millimeter where they treat the bathroom as a crime scene and proceed to film men engaging in sex acts um, and also just using the bathroom uh, for a couple of days. And um, it keeps getting, over the past like 10 years that I've known it to exist, it, it, it drops out of like X-Tube and gets put on these other sites. And now there's the paywall thing so you have to pay for shit. But I found it one in the middle of the night, like at 3 a.m., and down to rip the shit off um, line before it could disappear again. I was like, I gotta have it. It's a sign. Um, and so what I'm doing is putting those two together because I, I like the what they do to each other in terms of what they rub up against uh, is again going to that thing of like these men who are being surveilled by the police who are already assuming surveillance, right? But then there's you know uh, men who are freely within this constructed space that you have to literally create in terms of the editing, the way it's shot, it's just like, it's almost like labyrinth. Like the labyrinth reads, um, you know, and is, is, is a, a, pro a, a product of um, Brad's brilliance and his knowledge. It's literally taking the, um, the, the, the uh, core element or idea of the, gr the Greek uh, form of a labyrinth, um, Egyptian labyrinth, et cetera, and then refiguring himself as the minotaur. Uh, which is like half bull, half man. I was really, really struck by that. And then like this like pursuit, this like finding, seeking and receiving. And so um, in the point where I wanted to kind of like deal with the space in between those forms and, and bring in myself and also like thinking about like, um, you know, structuralist film um, aesthetic and how to use the figure within that. That's where um, my uh, performers, Sarah and Jeremy come in. And I shot that in my studio and I have them in these positions that deal with gestures, you know, primarily gestures that are like something that someone would see to suggest a sexual um, uh, act, but also the things that someone would look at if they're cruising. This piece is about cruising. Um, as a black queer woman, I completely admired, even though I know it comes from a, a space of an oppressed, uh, you know, livelihood, admire the fucking systems that black gay men, gay men in general have developed to be able to seek out each other for desire, for um, communication, et cetera. And so for the past year, I've been in sneaking into ba men's bathrooms and just like watching uh, and cruising myself uh, and just having conversations um, and observing those moments and learning how to Conver <laughs> just tell them about myself. Whatever. Conversations. <laughs> I mean, I'm not going to do what I did to Whitney. The Whitney, I, I was like, we should just go into bathrooms and turn up. You know? <laughs> uh, but <laughs> Because the systems, and what happens is that the sexiness is like, you know, when you're looking, <laughs> when I have Sarah and Jeremy, <laughs> when I have Sarah and Jeremy, the, the sexiness is the back. Just looking at the back is enough, you know, to kind of get you like, ooh. You know, it restructures <laughs> the way, the periphery, you know, the flush valve, you know, thinking about the flush valve as a, vil a, a, a mirror, thinking about, what it means mm. to come while looking at a flush valve, to come while looking at yourself, right? Those things that pe that suggest desire and objects, t taking that apart, it's just thinking about a little bit more about how these objects, you know, are seductive in, in, in a more pleasurable way and not kind of like, you know, mimicking this like, you know, overwrought, um, overworked um, idea of exploitation in that kind of sense. But um, that piece, uh, you know, Brad, uh, Brad and trying to figure out how to deal with both his um, femininity and his uh, masculinity, as well as my femininity and my masculinity. That's where um, Sarah and um, Jeremy come in and how I have them uh, figured, because they're kind of like an extension of my consciousness. And I, I like the idea of them cruising each other, but at the end of the day, it's about the self, um, the restraint, but also like, you know, these subtle uh, suggestions. Um, uh, and I and, and in continuation, lastly, in a continuation of what I'm interested in in regards to into subjectivity, I'm interested in showing things that are um, in one way um, able to be read by a community. So it's like kind of like hiding in plain sight. If you are not familiar with cruising, if you haven't cruised, there's things that's going completely over your head that are occurring in this. But those who actually are engaged in that, 
I'm sure that you have a different and more in-depth read of what's you know happening. And that's the kind of work that I like to present is something that shows its hand but still remains um, at the core of the people who actually engage in the act. Cool. Thank you. Um, Ray, Charles, any reactions to the films? I'm going to jump down and put on a slideshow with the stills in it as I ask you. So, or, thank you. Yeah. Reactions to the films, any? I think, um, like, water, both like, yeah. you know, uh, water is this uh, rejuvenator, water, of the, water is this rebirth, water is or just liquid as a site of exchange or... Uh, there's something really interesting in all that, to, like um, this, uh, that, that's a flow no, throughout. And again, just the really... Hey, can you hand me a book? I think it's really, and I, I, I thanked y'all as visual aids earlier, but I really want to be keen about that thank you. It's that you commissioned works from black artists to make work, right? Because uh, we're also experiencing, you know, Brontes is a good friend of mine, and uh, you know, I think we are all, or if we are not aware, uh, you know, Reina Gossett, who was another one of the filmmakers, recently had uh, some uh, work that she'd done taken over by another person and co-opted in a, in a very real way. So black makers are still very much in a, in a space where they need to be supported to make the work, right, in a way, and, and given opportunity and access to space to make the work. Uh, so I think that that's another foundational and really important piece to lift up is that these things matter not only in the idea of the, the creations, the films that are created, but what they do and what they allow to move forward. One thing I forgot to say, I wanted to shout out um, Shawnee Michaelaine Holloway. The other part of the film is the score. You guys did not hear it in the way that it was supposed to be heard. Uh, it's strangely low, uh, but it really is something that is like really, I think, took the film to a whole other level. Um, she's right here in the, the front. She's Chicago-based. Um, fantastic, fantastic artist, uh, yeah, multimedia artist, as well as like a noise musician. Um, and it was literally a last decision of mine to, um, when I was in Chicago, maybe a month ago, <laughs> it feels like. Um, I was like, yeah, I got this film, can you do this? And I need it in a week. <laughs> Uh, and so that, that, that score, though, really, um, I think, sets it to the next level. So when these things do go online, I please, please go back and listen to it and turn the volume up um, to appreciate the work that she put in on this. Well, um, I thought all of the films were very good, interesting. Um, I didn't quite understand all of them. I hmm. missed the rocks. Like, I'm still there. Just, I'm going to sleep on that one. Um, may blog about it. I need to figure it out. There's um, just a quick aside. There's a, we made a publication mm -hmm. which has artist statements, thousand word artist statements from each of the artists. And then as Tiana noted, we're going to um, they'll all go on our website um, as of Friday after our final premiere. But then we'll also roll out on our website the artist statements one a week with the videos. So there will be the artist statements available online too. So. Um, now, there's more info about Mickey's video in the artist statement. Listening to you yeah. about um, the gay men being able to navigate a world where they can find what they need, uh, it made me also. It made me think about um, what if gay men didn't have to navigate a world where they could find what they need. Absolutely. And, and so I always say that we've not created an environment. It's what I say about black gay men in the black community, that we, don't, we have not created an environment where they can live and be happy and nurtured. And so they find themselves dating in secret in these places, in the bathrooms. And so I... I um, like, for example, my best friend's gay. <coughs> oh, Lord, I said it on TV. <laughs> no, I said it. And um, no one ever asked him um, in his family um, what his future is. You know, do you want to get married? Do you want to adopt? Do you, how's your love life? It's accepted, and they understand it, but there's no discussion. And so he actually... And he's not by himself. There are a lot of gay men, and I know from my experience in the black community, that they live in isolation. Mm -hmm. 
And so what they created these places to find what they need to help them. I'm, I'm going deeper in a different no, no, kind of way, but you hear what I'm saying? I understand to say? what you're saying, but one thing I do just slightly want to push back on is that for the kinksters who have been living open and, and there's a specific desire for going to that, to have that kind of engagement, it's not uh, always a situation, I think, and that's what I, that's why I put the surveillance video of the police, that is a situation because they were talking about 1962s in, in Ohio, these men are seeking a certain kind of engagement, and I would even go further to say, to say maybe not all of those men are gay, um, but they're seeking to have this sexual engagement uh, with these men in this, these kind of circumstances. Um, and, and, and then why use the porn where it's like you have men who are performing, um, you know, many of them are, have, who, have, who are known to be these uh, porn stars who are uh, gay, some of them who are not, who are just like uh, these male porn stars, um, who are engaging in a way of pleasure out in the open, aware of the camera. Um, it's like, it's something that I, um, I think is really important to acknowledge that there are, uh, you know, these systems that exist in a, in systems that are being created that have to deal with desire. Like my piece is about desire and it was really impor important that this um, existed uh, with Brad Johnson because uh, he, he um, you know, uh, transitioned to AIDS in 96. He didn't die until 2011. Um, and the archivist who received his work, Stephen Fullwood, who um, formerly worked at the Schomburg, uh, you know, and also founded the End of Life Archives, when he received his uh, papers um, in hospice in Philadelphia where he died, Brad was very adamant about desire, sex. I, I like this, this, I love my body, I'm free. And his narrative plays very differently. Like I said, you know, he was an out gay man in the army pre as you know, pre don't ask, don't tell in the eighties. So it's like he was out and open. He has poems about going around in uh, the streets in his sailor outfit looking for men to have sex with in this way because that's what he liked, the structure, the discipline that comes from a military kind of like in, 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 in engagement. So there's like another part of that that people are on the other side where it isn't oppressed. And I'm saying that as someone who's from the South, right? I'm, I grew up in Greenville, South Carolina, um, where you know across the board there's a whole other level of conservatism that isn't always the same everywhere else based off of like you know um, spaces to be able to move. So there's two there's two folks. There are the people who occupy that space, but I don't really want to put it, them in within a, a oppres oppression or scarcity. Uh, uh, like a uh, way of moving, there is like a, a you know a, a, a proactive desire to do this okay, because it, they get off on it. You. The last picture, the picture before this of Bambi, I know Bambi, and I've been in some of those national meetings with her, and she is that's Bambi there. She's actually incredible, and what these women did in South Carolina uh, have been, has really been incredible, uh, and it made me think about. Um, all of these projects, uh, when we start talking about activism, um, we have to meet people where they're at, not where we want them to be. And it's, at least that's what my thought is. So this particular piece would do well in South Carolina, where actually none of the other pieces would because you know, they're a little above the head. <laughs> In what he years? Was, you know, <laughs> thinking, I mean, I'm still stuck <laughs> on the rock, so shit. <laughs> you know, but, but yeah. you know, they are, they're kind of caught up around. in the stereotypes yeah, and yeah. myths about, One or two. you know, HIV, AIDS, and sexuality, especially for the South. And so um, I just thought about this, this director, this person who did this, that I thought it was interesting in a series of very eclectic work, mm -hmm. they decided to, re to revisit the lives of women and do like a short documentary on them. And so I thought that was really, really interesting. Yeah. I just ask us again to really push for uh, not undercomplicating like scenarios, right? Like, I don't think we, there's no monotonous blackness. Like, black people are like, flourish. Some of them I don't like, you know, some of them I do like. There's all kinds of people. Some of y'all I might not like. There's all kinds of other things. I, don't, I just don't, I don't, I don't, I don't know if we, I, don't. I, I just have you to say. Would you, you, any of these work from your hometown? I'm gonna kill this right now. 
Um, <laughs> so if y'all go, I, I don't even ever do shit like this, but like, I'm on Instagram. If you go to Tiana M right now, uh, T I O N A M, scroll back a little bit about a month ago, you're going to see me in Greenville, South Carolina, uh, showing my mother the labyrinth. Um, her giving me feedback and, and me saying, now I can turn it in. Your mama raised you, though. No, my mama didn't raise this. <laughs> <laughs> that you see right now, mama, you know, like this is, this is a whole other creation. I don't even want to put that on my mom. Um, so my sister is my mom. That, like the out thing, the gay thing wasn't my issue growing up, oddly enough. Uh, there was other issues I faced outside of that. I've been out since I was 13 in South Carolina, Greenville born in Blytheville, Arkansas. So there is room <laughs> for, you know, conversations and a contemporary understanding, a modern understanding of like experimental work. I go home uh, every couple of months. Uh, I have a, you know, pretty big family. I'm an aunt of like four little, ba you know, baby uh, nephews and one niece. Um, I dress my niece up as a bull dagger this year. You also <laughs> see that uh, on my Instagram. So I think I really want to root for the uh, folks who are able to digest experimental narratives in South Carolina um, that don't have this like over the head thing. Uh, I think it's just com it's just complicated. And um, there is a subjective, you know, hand. I think having me as a daughter, of course, yes, helps helps to go in there. But you know, I definitely don't want to um, simplify, oversimplify. But for um, your story, things. there is also the story of the person who dies from AIDS and they throw away the refrigerator because they think that they can get HIV from the refrigerator. Absolutely. And, so, and that is today but current. How do we complicate that by like looking at the police state? Like how Absolutely. do we complicate that by looking at like socioeconomic issues? Like how do we complicate that by looking at like how infrastructure within the South has been consistently education within defunded and underfunded. The things that we're experiencing now on a national level have been happening in Georgia and Louisiana and all those places for many years, but it can't just, I, and you know, I get like where we're going, but we can't just, it's not a one-off. We have to be more nuanced about our conversations, yeah. particularly about our own identities. And we have to realize that there are other things it, and that interplay with one another that cr make an amalgamation for the situations. 45% of black people being infected with HIV in this country is not a mistake. It's not, it did not pop out of anywhere. The fact that we're still having this conversation 20 years after your cover is not a mistake. The fact that like now we're centralized amongst black gay men is also not a mistake. Like I want to be really clear that these are very intentional spaces that are being held by apparatuses that operate outside of people's just their choice. Mm -hmm. Whether their choice to go into an alley and get fucked in the dark or get fucked in, in the middle of the, mm -hmm. the, the road. Whatever they are, whatever, <laughs> wherever they're experiencing that dick, that is, <laughs> that is, you know, that's not the problem. The problem is not the dick in the butt. It is actually that yes. we didn't have the proper tools to say, oh, when was the last time did you go yes. over here yes. and, and do what you need to do? And once I know that, I can make any full life decision I need to. And let's mm -hmm. stop like regulating people to being like, I mean, we spent, I spent a good part of my life too long being like condoms, condoms, do this thing, condoms, 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 learn condoms. People who are never going to use condoms, right? Mm -hmm. If you're not going to make those choices, then it's not my job to tell you what to do. It's mm -hmm. like you can't. And now we're experiencing a, um, a whole nother wave that is very much backed by pharmaceutical companies when we're talking about like mm -hmm. PrEP as this alternative to choice. And I think, yes, it's a great tool. We should not like be misguided by it. But we actually need to investigate it in a very real way. We've had hearts since the mid-90s. That has not changed the outcome for people who look like me and who are like me. Mm -hmm. But it's, well, I mean. Drugs uh, are not going to do it. Okay, so you're making it seem I don't even know how to articulate what I'm hearing from you, but I know what I'm hearing from you, and I'm saying to you that um, part of the problem is that the stigma is so thick, especially in the South, but mm -hmm. the stigma is still thick in this country around HIV and our minds and attitudes and the information we digest about HIV is still stuck in the 80s and 90s, you know? And when you try to, to even begin to give information, people are looking at you like you're crazy. And so we really do need to get people, I think the solution is to get people tested. We're not gonna change people's behavior, but if we can get people tested and, and in treatment, 
You know, U does equal U. If a person's viral load is undetectable, they cannot transmit HIV. I mean, it's, so it's not just one solution, it's a lot of solutions. There's PrEP, there's fucking putting a condom on, there's keeping we your cannot, thing in your We yes cannot erase the fact that, like, I have, if you're talking about getting tested and I can't feed my children or I don't have to get a job or, like, every time I go into a space, I get that. That's not, that's not a thing. I'm not talking, I'm not disagreeing that you have to know that testing is the thing that you need, but like I'm, I'm more pushing for a more nuanced conversation that actually deals with the complexity in people's lives, that, that deals with the idea that you, what are your options in the world, right? Are black gay men seeing themselves reflected out into the larger world? Okay. And I think that films like this, our discussions like this, are doing that, and I think we're on a, a, a righteous path. But we can't just be like, oh, that was based on a choice that that individual made. The state is at play in that individual's life every time they step out of their home and every time they walk yes. around. Yeah. We can't also deny that. We just have to keep it in balance. Yeah, yeah. I think that yeah, this is the best panel I've ever been on around this. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, think, I, I love, I think conflict is so great because it yeah. provokes change. And so one of the things that's coming up for me is like this idea of we. Mm -hmm. When people say we, both of, both of you and even inclusive of me, is like to dismantle the idea of like, or break apart and explore what this we is and that we is a subjective thing, you know? And I see like, I, I'm pushing for this like intersubjective we as primarily we, my community, um, you know, thinking about folks who are very well versed in, uh, you know, their subjective experiences, black, queer individuals, black LGBTQ, whatever. Um, but I'm also like coming from multiple backgrounds. So I always try to keep an open view of like what that we could look like as inclusive of a lot of different folks. So I don't like think that there's any, both of you are saying this, the right things for, based off of these, both, both of, from your perspectives, but the we is coming from a different place. And I do want to say that it is not a strong point to come from um, a place of a, a, a looking at so much of an oppressive narrative um, in, in regards to like that being the mirror that you face every day. The power that I know that a lot of individuals, including myself, have come from was coming from this intersubjective you know, space that's like saying, this is where I uh, sit here and starting to learn to say like, this is how I feel, this is my perspective, X, Y, Z. And so I just really want to push for more of a conversation on where I stand or, you know, you stand, et cetera, so that we can then complicate and then become that we uh, that is really going to make the shit uh, turn its head and like, you know, push forward. So, yeah, that's it. <laughs> Like one or one? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. So I want to be conscious of time. We're at 8 o'clock, but if there's a burning question or two in the audience, we're open to that. Um, so if you have a burning question for the panelists. This retro great, but I'm going to take this so great. Yeah. Oh, it's this one. Yeah, uh, here. Can you guys share the black? Sure. Yeah, 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 yeah. So just raise your right hand here. and we'll come around Here's to the one. microphone just so your question is audible on this thing. Hi. Hey. I wanted to ask you more questions about your film. Okay. So I was listening to you uh, about the desire and the film clips that you picked show like black gay men. And I was thinking about like what an intimate moment you were capturing and we have like one clip of like well you were talking about how you have this one clip of these porn stars who are like voluntarily and then we also have like something that's like a clip of surveillance mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and i think when i think about both those although like the consent is different like mm -hmm. the willingness is different both of these really, like both of these lines really deserve respect. And mm -hmm. I wonder how you navigated that because those are such vulnerable moments. Mm -hmm. And like how you respected those bodies in order not to, because like that experience of the police mm -hmm. videotaping those was violent. So how do you mm -hmm. not create that violence? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. how do you further make sure that you're respecting those bodies even with the porn stars, so you're not mm. making it something of like a spectacle, so mm. you're like honoring them. Yeah, yeah, I think about that. A, I think that about that a lot. Thought about that with this, um, and came down to the thing of how it's just originated in the world before me, um, and how it's been consumed in a certain kind of way. 
Um, there's a couple of things that I do, uh, especially with the surveillance video, uh, that kind of like create a hard um, way to kind of deal or see. It's like flip to black or white. There's a certain kind of like grading that's done on it, et cetera. But I still see it as like a viable footage. It's like a documentary uh, footage. That is a documentary um, piece or artifact. The way that I approach the, the films um, that I'm using and the way that I actually source any kind of footage is in, a, in an artifact way. Um, is it is it ethical rubbing on a, a real fine ethical line? Absolutely. But um, I think the thesis of it that I'm trying to like deal with is what these two things did, what these two things dealt with in regards to this person's life, and also what I see uh, based off of like you know my experiences uh, dealing with both communities, both communities, one community that is under surveillance, the other community that is willing, uh, a willing participant. Yeah. Um, and kind of like, you know, taking that on my back to deal with, you know. Um, the other element is that um, I think that uh, my, my interest in actually push it, because this is like a project that kind of pushed me out of a, a bit of a comfort zone, is kind of how do I deal with the figure of a Brad Johnson? Um, someone who's, you know, some of his writing was difficult for me to consume in this way. Like, how do I create something that's just as difficult as that identity? Um, so that's, yeah, those are the things that I think about. But I don't think it's like an either or thing. I think it's a complicated thing that I'm willing to kind of stand behind doing. Yeah. I'll just do a quick follow-up too. Yeah. And I'll just do a quick follow-up. We've been in an ongoing conversation with Tiana throughout the process of putting together the project. And I know I speak for myself, but also the curator, particularly Vivian Crockett, who's been the curator most in touch with Tiana about the work. And we've been really impressed, and I've learned an immense amount from the way that Tiana is engaging these archives, thinking about legacy, taking a really rigorous, thoughtful, intentional, careful relationship to way, the way that these images are being reproduced, the way that some of the stills are living in the world, the way that Brad is being reflected. We had an, last night a highlight of the um, Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture um, screening was that some of Brad's materials were on view as part of a pop-up exhibition there. And we had an, uh, a conversation about how that would be figured in. And, and it was really powerful to see the a version of the, of the labyrinth and photos of Brad, and there's just a way that I've learned a lot from Tiana about how she is engaging these sort of quote unquote fractured archives and figuring them, um, but you know, revealing, but having a really intentional, careful way of activating that. So yeah. um, I think it's a great question. It's a great question. Maybe just one more question, and then hopefully Maybe. Tiana and Charles can hang out for a couple minutes. Thank, um, thank you. So I'm from South Africa, and um, I was um, listening to uh, what Charles was just saying just now about like having a more nuanced conversation about um, you know racism, sexuality, you know that kind of thing. And I was just thinking about like um, Chabo Beki when he was present back in the day. Uh, I don't know. I don't think he was an ace denialist. I think I think he was, he was maybe in many ways suggesting that we should have a conversation around pharmaceuticals and the social the social issues around HIV and AIDS and the disease and stuff like that. And it just kind of like made me think about that. I don't know. It's, that was the comment. But my question is. Um, uh, I don't, you know, I was always asking my wife, she's from Chicago, like, why is there, like, no, you know, like, what happened to AIDS in America? What happened to HIV in America, you know? Like, I don't remember the last time I saw, like, a, a Hollywood movie about HIV or AIDS and stuff like that, and it's, like, filmmakers and artists, I just, um, you know, just would like to hear, like, comment from, you know, like you guys on like mainstream sort of projection of that. Thank okay, you. so I, th I, th um, w with the, um, <laughs> with the advancement of treatment and care around HIV AIDS, uh, it has, it's no longer a sexy topic. 
it's not the hot topic. Uh, World AIDS Day was on Friday, and I didn't see one major news outlet do a big story on it. Now, maybe you did, I didn't. And, uh, you know, I remember the times when it was the cover of the New York Times and the covers of the USA Today. And I remember it just even by my workload. And I didn't have a gig. I'm like one of the most name recognizable women. Well, I did have a gig, it was local. But, you know, sometimes I would do three cities on World AIDS Day. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was that important of a topic. And it's just not. And I think some of it is connected to uh, out of sight, out of mind. People are living longer with HIV. Mm -hmm. We're not seeing the deaths at the rapid rate that we once did in the way that we once did. And so people don't think about it I anymore in this particular way. Um, uh, that's, can I say, yeah. I mean, it, it, I think the, the, the first mistake is to think about mainstream as a source of anything that is gonna be a viable uh, <laughs> litmus to any kind of, any kind of shit. I mean, it, it's just even more <laughs> so under this administration, it's just the mainstream is out. Um, I hope that we get a little bit more, uh, you know, subculture a little bit below that, get a little bit more independent, um, you know, and again, you know, just thinking about coming from that I place, from my perspective, uh, and from the, the places and the spaces that I occupy, it is a big issue. Um, and it's um, a, a, a year round issue, um, you know, uh, and it's not just, uh, a, I think it's just because of maybe I live in Philadelphia. Philadelphia has a huge, um, uh, you know, black uh, population as well as like black gay population. So there's adverts in a lot of um, spaces. When I'm in New York, I see a lot of adverts in a lot of spaces. Um, and it does go through pharmaceuticals. But what I also want to kind of jump on, because it's a little rambly, to jump to the idea around or concept um, or subject matter of pharmaceuticals is, you know, when you're thinking about um, uh, uh, positives and how they relate to these organizations. Organizations deliver amount of positives to stay funded um, and uh, to kind of like, you know, continue a certain kind of um, funding structure without actually creating um, opportunities to think about in a realistic way of how to curb uh, or think about, um, uh, uh, you know, abating um, acquisitions because it's just money now, you know? Um, and I think that you could find that information in a lot of independent documentaries. You can find that information into your local HIV clinic um, if it is truly an interest of yours um, to go see. And on an international plane, I mean, with YouTube, you can put in AIDS and uh, spend the next year and a half watching without eating and sleeping, uh, tons and tons of works that people are, um, you know, putting out self-testimonies. That's why the internet's pretty so dope, you know, so dope in this way is that people are just talking about their, um, you know, issues across the country in different ways, internationally, et cetera. Um, so it's like, you know, this idea of mainstream is out. I mean, you know, mainstream is under attack by the Trump administration, this whole fake news shit. I really, really need people to really understand what the impact that that is playing on um, and uh, on our own news outlet outlets, which I never really cared for, anyways. But how that is turning um, and trickling down even to the ones that are independent sources that we look at, like how do we cover news? So it really has to come from a, a little bit more of a subjective place and looking at multiple sources to come up with your own consensus. I think. Yeah, yeah. I, I totally agree. But there is a there is a reality still in mainstream that uh, we don't really talk about HIV and mainstream the way we do on special occasions when Charlie Cheen uh, goes public with his HIV status, you know, and then you spend the rest of the day on social media, you know, trying to explain to people what all of that meant, you know. It doesn't happen in mainstream news. They don't have the debate. We have the debate. AIDS activists have the debate. Hydea Broadbent, me, all the other people I know that do this work on a day-to-day -day basis, we use social media very heavily to do this work. So we're trying to explain to people that when Charlie Cheen said that he didn't have sex with the person with the condom and they knew their HIV status, uh, that Charlie couldn't transmit the virus. When we say that it's a problem, he could not transmit the virus. That's a fact. When we say there's a problem that when someone can take a picture of your medicine cabinet and then blackmail you, 
that, that's what we, that's the discussion we have on Twitter and, we, and on Facebook and through Instagram and we try to challenge a, a lot of the chaos that happens in the mainstream world. And so the mainstream, sensation, they do sensational stories on HIV, but then that's about it. You know, and so even funding is in jeopardy right now because all monies are going to opiates, you know, and HIV education money is being used, literally HIV education money is being used for opiates, so to educate on opiates because opiates is a... It, uh I got it. Yeah. O opiates are now affecting the white community. Right, okay. So that's, <laughs> which is why we're saying opiates instead of like <laughs> dope and crack and shit like that. So yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, why, why do we not see it in America anymore? I mean, who's dying? Yeah. Like, right? Yeah. Like who's surviving? Who gets to live? Who, exactly. Who gets to live? Like, Poor people don't get to live. Drug users especially don't get to live. You know, gay boys, no, you know, trans folks, y'all especially don't get to mm -hmm. live, right? And so this valuation of like who is valuable, who isn't valuable, and so <laughs> the, that's why in my larger conversation, we cannot disconnect these from larger issues that we're, are at play in our lives, right? We can talk about those things and we can talk about HIV as a singular issue, but HIV is an amalgamation of yes. racism and socioeconomic like discrimination, lack of education, all of these things, lack of housing, mm -hmm. separating these things out into like these pillars of space that, oh, that just happened over in this isolated area and it's just a phenomenon is bullshit and how they tricked us the last time. And so like I'd be doing a disservice to all the people I've personally lost if I don't actually complicate that by issuing in who they were as people and where they grew up, what their access were to jobs, or access to all levels of things. That is more, that is actually the reason why, the reason why the right people are dying again. So we can become silent again, right? We can just shut up again. Because you know, if you're educated and you're not a drug user and you have access, that's all good. Who's getting access to PrEP, post, pre exposure post prophylaxis? Who are the most users of that as a, as a Bible? And who is that being pushed by? And this whole idea of like these, we set up systems, these eight service organizations who've done really amazing work. I've worked for many years and I still have many friends who are doing that hard work of being in there and in those trenches. But who is lifting those organizations up at this mm -hmm. point? I'm talking about Gilead and these other, is, does it make sense for them to work themselves out of business? Is that how capitalism works? I mean, we have to be much better about our analysis. And that's all like, yeah, that, that to me is why it's not the thing you see. I think I agree, but I still got to say that at the end of the Crying. day, <laughs> we, I mean, what? at the end of the day, we really, we can change the statistics. I mean, it's something, yeah, okay, you're poor. I go to Cook County Hospital to get my medicine. I, my medicine is $54,000 a year, and thank God for Medicare. I don't know if I'm going to have it that much longer because of Trump. But so everything ain't what it seems. If someone today come to me and tell me they're HIV infected, they can go to Cook County and get into treatment and care. And their treatment and care will give them a, a life expectancy that they wouldn't have had if they didn't know their HIV status, if they didn't get into care. And guess what? If they're into care, they can't infect anybody else. 38% of newly diagnosed cases are people infected by people who did not know their HIV status. And we can sit here all day. I mean, my first two degrees is in political science, and we can talk about socioeconomical and, the, and capitalism and all of that, but something practical has to fucking happen to stop this damn disease. And we can't depend on the government to do it. Because yeah, yeah. they ain't going to do it. They fucking get ready to put a pedophile in, in, into the US Senate. Good Lord. And so this is where we're at. This is where we're at. And we collectively, how many of you all in here been tested for HIV? Everybody. It's a good crowd. <laughs> if you have not been tested for HIV, then you are doing yourself a disservice. 
because you think you know, you hope you know, you pray you know, but at the end of the day, you really don't know. And if the penis ain't in your pocket, you have no idea what it's doing when it ain't with you. And that's the bottom line. Okay. But we can begin to do something about this disease. Okay, I'm done. You want us to finish final word? No. Chicago. Here we are, Chicago. Yeah. <laughs> Michelle Hayes yeah. is in Chicago. Um, yeah, so thank you all for a very wide-ranging, heated discussion. Um, a couple of final points. I have books up at the front if you're interested. $10 suggested donation. And the videos all go online on Friday. Um, thank you so much. Come talk to me if you want to know more about Visual Aids in Chicago. And I'm not shameless. You can follow me on Instagram <laughs> at Ray R -A -E -L -T. <laughs>